Today I want to share with you a no sugar strawberry jam recipe. And if you want to take things one step further, I'm going to share a step-by-step -step water bath canning tutorial so that you can can your no sugar strawberry jam and store it in your pantry. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, this jam couldn't be easier to make. All you're going to need are two pounds of fresh strawberries, one cup of water, and some no sugar or low sugar pectin. Now this is a one pound container of strawberries and that's about four cups of fresh strawberries and we're going to have two pounds so we're going to need about eight cups of fresh strawberries and the first thing we want to, that we're going to want to do is just give them a good wash. Well I've got my strawberries all washed and now what we want to do is hull them. Now you can, the easy way is if you want you can just slice the top right off or if you want, you can go down a little deeper with your knife, sort of getting the core, more or less, of the strawberry. Now, as you slice the tops off of your strawberries or core them, whatever way you want to do it, don't throw any of this out. You can use this to make a wonderful strawberry vinegar. And I have a video where I show you how to do that, and I'll be sure to link to it in the iCards and in the description below. Now, once you remove the tops, all you want to do is start slicing up your strawberries. It, nothing fancy, because you'll see what the next step is going to be. But you just want to make them uh, a little smaller than their whole size. As I'm slicing these up, I just want to give you a little tip that when you make a no sugar jam, whether it's strawberries or any other type of berry or fruit, the riper the fruit, the better, because you're really uh, relying on the natural sugars in the fruit to give it some boost of flavor. Now this recipe makes six eight ounce jars, also known as half pint size jars, of no sugar strawberry jam. And in order to make those six eight ounce jars, we need four cups of crushed strawberries. Now I'm just gonna hand crush these with a fork because my strawberries are nice and ripe, so hopefully it'll go smoothly. But if you wanna make this really easy, you can certainly pulse them, but do it quickly and don't let it become like real mushy. You want it a little chunky. You can certainly pulse them in a food processor. And what I like to do is just sort of anchor a few with my hand and just so that they don't go flying <laughs> and just work my way through little by little mashing all of the strawberries. And I'll take a close up picture and overlay this so you can see exactly what it looks like as I do this. And as I go through the process of mashing these strawberries, I'll just start filling my cup over here to see when I get one full cup. Well, now I've got one cup of crushed strawberries here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just transfer this to my bowl. And then I'm gonna continue crushing the rest of my strawberries until I have a total of four cups crushed. Now, as I'm finishing up these strawberries, I just want to mention that if you would prefer to make a low sugar strawberry jam, you can definitely do that. And I have a video where I show you how to make that. And I, in that video, I also walk you through the water bath canning process. So if that's something that interests you, uh, you can watch that video uh, as well. It's a very similar recipe. Obviously, just there's just some sugar added. <laughs> Well, I've got my four cups of crush, crushed strawberries here, and now I just want to get every last little bit off of my plate, all of the juice. Make sure you don't waste anything. And don't worry if as you're crushing up your strawberries, your two pounds of strawberries, if you have a little more than four cups crushed or a little less than four crushed cups, it's not an exact science, but it's gonna come out to be about four cups crushed, and that's perfect. If a little under, a little over, don't worry. Since I'm gonna be water bath canning this jam once it's made, I need to go ahead and get my water bath canner ready because everything needs to be done very hot and very quickly. But if you don't want to water bath can this jam and you just wanna put it in your refrigerator once it's made, 
I'll put the timestamp in the description below underneath this video, and I'll also put the timestamp in the pinned comment as well, because I know for some of you it's a little easier for you to uh, find the pinned comment. And so you can jump ahead to where we start making the jam. Now, if you do want to water bath can this jam, the first thing that you need to do is get your water bath canner ready. Now, I have an electric water bath canner. You don't need this. You can use a plain old stock pot. That'll work perfectly. You can also use the traditional stovetop water bath canner if you have one of those. But be sure to check with your manufacturer, your stove manufacturer's guidelines to make sure that those stovetop water bath canners are safe to use on your stovetop. Now, if you have an electric water bath canner like this, or you have a stovetop water bath canner, chances are it came with a rack like this. But if you're gonna be using a stock pot, and you don't have a rack like this, no problem. You might have a cooling rack that you use for your baked items that'll fit in inside your stock pot, and that'll work great. But if you don't have anything like that, don't worry. Since you're gonna be canning, you're gonna have canning rings. And canning rings can make a great uh, rack uh, for you to use in your stock pot. And all you're gonna do is just put them in a pattern, uh, like as if you had a round rack like that, and then you're just gonna take a little uh, kitchen twine and tie or, or twist ties, whatever you have, and just link them together. And I'll overlay a, uh, a little video so you can see what I'm doing and exactly what I'm talking about. So you'll just go around connecting all of them like I started to do here. I've connected an outer one to the middle one and then another outer one to another outer one, and so on and so forth. And then you're just gonna go all the way around, connecting them with little twist ties, or as I said, some kitchen twine. And then you're gonna have a great rack that you can put in the bottom of your stock pot that your jars will go on top of. Next, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have your canning jars ready. And you just want them clean, washed with warm, hot, soapy water, and left, left to air dry is fine. Uh, they're gonna be going into the hot canner anyways while they're waiting for the jam, so that'll help keep them clean. Next, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have your rings, and then normally with your rings, maybe when you bought your jars, uh, they came with rings and lids. If not, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you do have your rings, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have new lids. Every time you can something, whether you're water bath canning or uh, pressure canning, you want to make sure that you have new lids, unless you have like the Tatler reusable lids. Um, but for the most part, you're going to need brand new lids if you don't have those reusable ones every time you can. Now, I just want to mention I'm using these sort of pretty little jars, but if you just have these plain, um, they are nice, they have a little crystal pattern on them, but if you just have the straight up uh, eight ounce jars uh, that are for, made for jam, you can also use these as well. Now, canning rules and regulations, so to speak, do change over time. And there are sort of different schools of thoughts now, different schools of thought on, uh, in terms of the bands and the lids. Uh, Basically, the bands, if they've been washed in warm soapy water and dried, left to air dry, they're fine. They're all ready to go. Um, in terms of the lids, it's pretty much the same thing. You can just wash them with warm, hot, soapy water, allow them to air dry, and keep them clean and be ready uh, to put them on top of your jars once you put your jam in. Uh, another way of doing it, which is how I was taught, which I believe now is sort of considered the old school way, is to keep them in hot water just for a minute or two uh, so that they're nice and clean uh, when you get ready to put them onto your jar. And the reason for that is, you know, whenever it comes to canning, being very neat and clean is very important uh, so that you don't introduce any bad bacteria uh, into, your, into your product that you're canning. Um, but you do need to be careful if you keep these in hot water because I will show you, these have a little rubber lid, uh, a little rubber ring uh, around the lid. And that is what helps you see it's right around here, it's sort of a burnt orange color. And that's what helps create the suction and make a nice tight seal. You never want to boil these. If you were to boil them, it can loosen, or not loosen, but damage that little rubber uh, seal there. And so that can uh, 
make it very difficult for this lid to create a good seal on your jar. Um, and so some people feel that keeping them in the hot water can also create that problem. So the new canning rules often say, just ha have them nice and clean, wash them in a warm soapy water, let them air dry, and keep them clean before you're ready to put them onto your jar. Next, what we're gonna do is put our jars into our water bath canner and fill it with water and start bringing it up to temperature because this will keep the jars nice and hot and be ready to receive the jam. But as I put them in, I like to just check and make sure they're in good condition and that there's no cracks or imperfections, especially on the rim of the jar. Now we're going to do this again. We're going to check it when we take them out too to make sure nothing happened when they were submerged in the hot water waiting for the jam. But it's good the first time around just to give them a little look-see and see how they're, they're holding up, how they've held up maybe from previous canning adventures. So I'm just going to go ahead and get all of these jars in here. And you, you don't want to have them touching. You want to give them plenty of room. Next, you want to fill your water bath canner, including filling the jars, with water so that there's enough water in here that the jars are covered by at least an inch, so at least an inch or two inches above the top of the jar. Well, I've got this all filled and the water is about an inch or so uh, over the top of my jars and I'll overlay a picture so you can see exactly what that looks like. Now, what we want to do is bring this up to a simmer so that they're staying nice and hot in, in the water. And normally what I do is I'll bring it up to a boil and then once it comes up to a boil, I turn it down to a simmer. And once it's simmering, then I proceed with making my jam. Well, this is nicely simmering and before we make the jam what I want to do is go over the other equipment that you're going to need to water bath can. First you're going to want a jar lifter. Second you're going to want some kind of funnel. This is a very clever funnel because it has the headspace measurements on it uh, which come in handy because depending on what you're canning determines how much headspace, how much basically airspace you need to leave between the item that you've put in your jar and the distance up to the rim of the jar. So this is a very clever funnel but any funnel you have will work. Next, you're going to want to have some type of ladle. I like this ladle because it has a little hook here on the end and that makes it very easy to hook onto the side of your pot uh, in between ladling the jam or whatever you're canning into your jars. But again, any ladle will do. Next, you're going to need what's called a debubbler. Now, if you don't have one of these, don't worry, you can use a knife, it works just fine. Uh, but what's clever about a debubbler, uh, in the case of this particular one, it has little notches here. And I'll take a picture and overlay it. Uh, hopefully you can see it up close, but it, it's, it is difficult to see. But there are markings here that show a quarter inch, half inch, three quarter inch, one inch, so on and so forth. So you can measure on your jar to see if you have the correct headspace. So this is a very clever debubbler. So you'll definitely need one of those. Then finally what you're going to need is one of these little sticks that have a magnet on the very end. And this is what you use to lift the lids that you're going to put on top of your canning jar. Now I've got my lids here. They're all washed in hot soapy water, allowed to air dry, and I've got them on a clean paper towel. And so when we get ready to put our lids on our jars that have been filled with the jam, We'll just go ahead and this will uh, pick that right up. I won't have to touch it with my hand. Put it down onto the jar and everything stays neat and clean. And as to all your equipment, you want to make sure that it's been washed in hot soapy water and is clean. And that's why I've got this sitting all on a nice clean dish towel. Okay, now that we've got all of the canning information out of the way, we're ready to make our jam. Now to make your jam, you're going to want some type of nice big pot. And the reason is we're going to be bringing this up to a boil and it can sputter and make a little bit of a mess if your pot's not big enough. You also want to be very careful not to have any of it sputter onto you and potentially get burned. So a nice big pot works great. The first thing we're going to do is take our strawberries that we crushed, our four cups of crushed strawberry, and add that to our pot. Now, 
The next thing that we're going to do is add in our water. But I want to mention something about the water. Many of you have written to me and told me that you're on keto diets or some sort of autoimmune uh, what do you call it? protocol diet and that you cannot have fruit juice. You can have certain types of fruit like berries, but you can't have fruit juice. And so making this jam be acceptable to your particular diets would require you using water as your liquid. However, if you don't follow one of those diets, and since this is a no sugar jam, but you'd like to try to give it a little bit of sweetness from something other than white sugar, instead of this one cup of water, you can add one cup of juice. You could add one cup of white grape juice. You could add one cup of apple juice, some mild flavored, mild colored juice. And that'll help boost the natural sweetness from the fruit juice as opposed to adding sugar. However, if you want to make it keto friendly or autoimmune protocol friendly, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, then you just want to go ahead and, and have your one cup of liquid be water. So just go ahead and add in that water right in with your crushed strawberries. Now, the only other ingredient that you're going to need is pectin. And this is just commercial pectin that you can buy at your grocery store. And you're going to want to look for the pectin that says that it's made for using less sugar or no sugar recipes. And you can buy it in a box like this. This is from the SureGel company. And this has one packet inside, which is exactly the right amount that you would need. Or if you, do, if you are new to canning, but you find over time you enjoy canning and you want to buy your pectin in larger amounts, you can buy it in containers like this. This is put out by Ball. And this is also a low or no sugar needed pectin. Now today I'm gonna to go ahead and use this pectin. And if, you're, if you are using something that's packaged in a larger container like this, as opposed to the box, you're going to want to use four and a half tablespoons of the no sugar pectin. If you're using the box, it's very easy. You're just going to use the whole packet that's right inside of here. Now I'm going to bring you over to my stove for the next part, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to bring this up to a boil and as we're bringing it up to a boil, we're going to keep stirring it and we're going to gradually add in the pectin and keep stirring. And once we get it up to a boil, we're going to let it, uh, to the, once we get it up to a boil that we can't stir down, so no matter how much you stir it, it's still rapidly boiling. We're going to boil it like that for one more minute. And it's gonna really be boiling, you're gonna keep stirring it, and we're gonna go one more minute. Now before we go over to the stove, the first thing that I'm gonna do is put a plate into my freezer. And the reason for this is we're going to put a little bit of the jam on this cold plate after we've boiled it at a hard boil like that for one minute to see if it's gelled properly. And I'll show you what the test for that is. There's one other thing I wanna to mention to you as we go over to the stove and bring this jam up to a boil. You may see some foam develop. Now don't worry about that. All you're gonna do is skim it off because you don't want that included in your jam. However, another way to tamp that down is by adding just a little bit of butter and you don't need much. For this amount of jam, maybe a half a teaspoon of butter will help control that uh, foam. However, if you don't wanna add any fat to this, that's fine, you don't need to worry. We're just gonna skim off the foam. Well, this jam looks wonderful. I'll take a picture and overlay it. And any foam that kind of came around the sides, I just removed that. It's very easy to do. I you just take my spatula and just lift it off like that. One, two, three, I'll overlay a picture so you can see me doing that. We brought this over to the stove, as I shared with you earlier, and we brought it up to a boil that we could not stir down and as we were bringing it up to a boil we were at gradually adding the pectin kept stirring kept stirring once we reached the point where we couldn't uh, stir down the boil we continued to let it boil for another minute and now i've removed it from the stove 
Now I just wanted to get my plate out of the freezer to show you how to check if your jam has gelled up appropriately. But you really probably don't have to worry because modern day commercial pectin that you can buy uh, does a very good job. But what you're gonna do is just get a little bit and put it on a plate like this and it's <laughs> sticking to my spoon. And then I'll show you as it cools on the plate how to check if it's perfect. So you'll just give it like a minute or so to cool and then you're gonna take a clean finger and you're just gonna pull it through like this. And see that? The jam stays separated, then you know it's well gelled. Now I'm gonna take my jar lifter and I'm gonna lift my first jar out of the water bath canner and I'm just gonna empty the water out of it. Be very careful because that's hot water. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take a clean paper towel and put this out of the way so you can see. And then I'm just gonna go over the rim of the jar to make sure that while it was in the water bath canner, it didn't develop any nicks. Sometimes something can happen, you can get a little crack or something. Now we're gonna do this again with vinegar before we put the lid on, but I always like to just do that step just to make sure nothing happened during the um, simmering process. Now we're gonna get our ladle and we're gonna start to ladle our gorgeous jam. This is just beautiful, the color is glorious. And we're gonna start ladling this down into our jar. Now, for jam, we wanna, oop, I got all of you. For jam, we wanna leave a quarter inch headspace. Now, as I shared with you earlier, this funnel is terrific because it's got the markings. And when I see it come up to the quarter inch headspace marking, I'm gonna stop filling it. But if you didn't have a funnel that had these markings, again, most bubblers will often come with this uh, headspace <laughs> headspace markings and so you can just use that and submerge that down into your jam and make sure that you've got that quarter inch headspace next what you want to do is take the debubbler and just go around in there to make sure that you don't have any air space now don't worry if you do find air pockets and the jam decreases down that's okay because you can easily ladle in a little bit extra. Now you want to take your clean paper towel, dip it in a little bit of white vinegar, and then you're going to take it and you're going to go all around the rim of your jar to make sure that it's completely clean before you put your lid on because you don't want any jam in the way because then your lid won't stick securely. Then once we get the rim of our jar clean, I'm gonna go ahead and take my little magnet tool. I'm gonna to take, see, it sticks right to the lid. It's beautiful. And then I'm gonna put the lid right down even on top of my canning jar. Then once you get your lid properly positioned, you're gonna take your canning ring and you're going to put it on your jar. Now, the only purpose that the canning ring serves is to keep the lid in place during the processing process. So all you want to do is put your ring on, start to screw it, and the minute you feel resistance, stop, and then just turn it a little bit more. And that's what's known as fingertip tight. Don't use any brute force and really tighten this. The reason is during, as I said, the ring is only to keep the lid in place. During the canning process, what happens is if there's any air in your jar, it's going to leach out. And then once you take it out of the hot water bath and let it cool, the lid forms a tight seal and you hear the ping. <laughs> And then you remove the ring after 24 hours. So if you were to do brute force, what would happen is that none of the air that may be in your jar would be able to escape. And the pressure would just start to build up and potentially your jar could break. So you really want to avoid that. So remember, 
I know I say this a lot in my canning videos. You just, you're just going to go until you just feel resistance. Just until you feel some resistance and then a little tighter. That's it. So once we've got that ring finger tight, we're just going to take our jar lifter again securely and put that down into our water bath. And then we'll proceed with filling all of our other jars and then we'll crank this up for the canning process. Alrighty, well I've got my jars in my canner. I'm going to put the lid on and, whoops, and I've turned it to the canning mode, which is going to bring it up to a full rolling boil. Once it comes up to a boil, I'm going to let it boil for 10 minutes. And now if you're doing this on the stovetop, in a stovetop canner, water bath canner, or in a stock pot, you're going to want to do the same thing. Bring it up to a boil and let it boil for 10 minutes. Now I want to mention one other thing. Hopefully I'm speaking a little louder so you can hear me over this. But I want to mention one other thing. I did not add any vinegar to my water. I used to do that because I have very hard water. But in learning from other canners, there is some difference of opinion whether to add the vinegar or not. And what they have found was that over time, adding the vinegar to the water caused their rings to start to discolor. So I've decided not to add vinegar to my water anymore. And if my jars look a little cloudy on the outside, from being in the water bath, then I just wash them up and they're fine. Well, this has been boiling for 10 minutes. My timer just went off. So I'm gonna turn this off and then I'm gonna remove the lid. I'm just gonna let it calm down a little bit. Be careful because whether you're doing this on the stovetop or in one of these electric water bath canners, they are boiling at quite a good clip and uh, the water can bounce out and I don't want you to get burned and always open a little away from you because there is a lot of steam that comes out. Now you're going to want to let these sit in the hot water for five minutes before removing them from your canner. Now while they're sitting in the canner, I just want to talk about questions and also diagnosing problems. But before I talk about that, I just want to mention one other thing. Uh, when we started this process, I talked about why I don't want to put vinegar uh, into my canner because I've learned from some other canners that can cause some discoloring and degrading of your rings. And even though you can't use the lids again, you always have to use new lids, you can reuse your rings really basically forever. And so you really want to try to keep them in as good condition as possible. And speaking of those canners that I learned these various tips from, I wanted to mention some of them to you. And I will put links to their channels uh, in the description below underneath this video. And I'll also put it in the pinned comment because I know for some of you, it's a little easier to find the pinned comment. But uh, if you enjoy canning and you want to learn about water bath canning or you want to learn about um, pressure canning, especially pressure canning, these gals are terrific. Well, actually, it's there's one fella in the group. But uh, the one person is Linda from Linda's Pantry. Uh, she's got lots of canning videos. She's terrific. I've been watching her for years. And then there's Lisa over at Sutton's Days. She has a lot of uh, pressure canning as well as water bath canning. Both Linda and Lisa have uh, all water bath and pressure canning, uh, as do all of these folks. And then there's Mandy over at More to Life, and she's just lovely, and again, lots of great canning. And then Heather over at the Needy Homesteader, and even though it says needy, it's uh, like with a K, as in kneading bread. So in addition to her canning videos, she has uh, bread baking videos and a lot of other things as well. And then there's Carol over at the Thrifty Chic Housewife, very cute channel name and lovely lady. And she's got a lot of great canning videos. And then finally, the one gentleman in the group is Paul. And the name of his channel is Paul's Rule of Thumb. And Paul is a very nice fella. And he really, I mean, most of his channel is canning. You can really learn a lot from Paul. So highly recommend, uh, recommend his channel if you're, and especially pressure canning. Um, but all of them, they're all terrific and all do lots of canning. So uh, definitely head over and uh, give them a look. Now, talking about questions. 
I want to mention that, uh, yes, I have other water bath canning videos. I know sometimes I get in comments and questions if I do any canning, and I have a whole playlist of water bath canning videos, and they're really directed at beginners, and they go step by step by step, start to finish, covering the whole water bath canning process. And I'll be sure to link to that playlist in the iCards and in the description below. I, I have a low sugar strawberry jam, I have pickles, I have tomatoes, I also talk about, I go over all the equipment that you need, all of the supplies you need, different books that are helpful. So be sure to check that out, especially if you're a beginner. And the other question that I get is, can you use alternative sweeteners when making a jam that you don't want to have any sugar in it? And yes, you can. And mostly the sweeteners that I'm being asked, asked about are the like basically zero calorie or, or close to that sweeteners. And if you wanted to add uh, something like a stevia to this, you would add just one quarter to one half teaspoon of the liquid stevia. Now, if you wanted to use like monk fruit or I think the other ones are called that are so sometimes they're mixed, but I think they're based with uh, erythritol, something like that. Uh, and then you have Splenda and things like that. What you need to do is you need to look at the instructions of those different sweeteners and find out what is the equivalent of one cup of sugar. And then that is the amount that you would add to your jam up to three cups. So if, and I, I don't use these, so I don't know, but for example, if Splenda was a one-to-one, -one, one cup of sugar to, uh, that one cup of Splenda equaled one cup of sugar, then you could add up to three cups of Splenda to give your jam the taste of a low sugar jam. It w if you wanted to go full sugar, usually the full sugar jams have about six cups of sugar. But uh, if you just are making a low sugar jam that has a nice fruity taste yet with some sweetness, uh, then you would go up to no more than three cups or whatever the equivalent was of the sweetener you were using uh, to one cup of sugar. Now diagnosing problems. Probably the most common problem when it comes to water bath canning is that when you remove your jars from your water bath canner and are letting them cool on your counter, and speaking of letting them cool on your counter, you're gonna wanna put down you know, a couple of layers of a nice cushiony dish towel, or if you've got one of these, um, what are they called, like little dish, you know, sort of padded dish drains. These work really great too. Uh, and when you take them out, you want to make sure, which I'll show you, you want to keep them very straight. That's just, the, <laughs> this thing is cooling down from being so hot on top of there. Um, but what if you don't hear the ping? Don't necessarily worry. You might be out of the kitchen. Some of you might miss it. W what you want to notice is, is the top depressed? You know, the, the little canning lids have like a little little dimple on top and it's somewhat raised when it's brand new and after going through the canning process it sinks down a little so that's what you're going to look for and if for any reason you don't get a good seal and that little dimple doesn't isn't you know that didn't sink down a little bit that's okay sometimes it'll happen to to one or one or two jars every now and again all you have to do is refrigerate it that can be the first one that you use and if you find that canning just isn't your thing, don't worry, I have you covered. As you know, I'm a big fermenter, and I've got playlist after playlist of showing you how to make all different kinds of ferments. And I'll be sure to link to those in the iCards and in the description below if that's something that you want to look into. Alrighty, well, it's been about five minutes, so let's go and take our jars out. Again, a good strong grip with your uh, jar lifter. And don't worry about the water on top. We'll just blot that off. Oh, you hear it? <laughs> it pinged very quickly. And what you want to do is be sure to keep them upright. See, just keep them upright. Whoops. Ooh. 
didn't mean to bang that, but just keep them up, oh, that ping too. Just keep them upright and just keep taking them out. Nice and straight. Oh, that one pinged too. So you just go ahead and keep getting all your jars out until you're done and then we'll let them cool. Now I took a picture from over top so that you can see, in case you don't hear the ping, you will notice when you look at the top and even if you go over it with your hand, you'll feel just the, just the slightest indentation or, or basically you won't see that little bit of raised dimple anymore that you would have seen on the, on the uh, lid that had not yet gone through the canning process. So that's a good way to tell too. Now, you know, to tell that it's sealed. Now, you're going to want to wait 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you're going, assuming they've all got a good seal on them, and then you're gonna remove your ring and then you can store this in your pantry and it'll be shelf stable. For now, Ball says that their lids are shelf stable for up to 18 months. Now I know some canners will say, oh, it can last a lot longer than that, but the official uh, word from uh, the Ball canning lid manufacturer used to be one year, but now uh, they say their lids are improved and, and should keep your, your food shelf stable for 18 months. So that's good news. But one thing I want to mention is you do want to remove this ring. And the reason is, if you leave the ring on and for any reason the lid loosens over time, the, the contents would be exposed to oxygen. And the, but the ring being in place would cause the lid to reseal again. But that would be a false seal. And when you go to open it, say you remove the ring and then you open your jar, you may find mold. So it's best to always remove your ring before you put your canned good away for storage. So definitely keep that in mind. Now, if you've enjoyed learning about water bath canning, be sure to check out this video over here where I have a playlist of all sorts of water bath canning videos and I walk you through step by step, start to finish. And I think you're gonna really learn a lot and I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.